Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us over uh, the dinner hour. This is a new experience for us. I'm Eric Merkel, your uh, host and cruise director for tonight's uh, OPA forum. This is group consultation for new telepsychology users. And tonight's experience is scheduled to go from 6.30 till 7.30. Uh, we would ask, uh, just as a starting point, if uh, you're new to Zoom or these kind of um, commercial experiences to please make sure that, as you hear my dog in the background barking, mm -hmm. uh, please make sure that you have yourself on mood, uh, mute, uh, put your cell phones on stun, uh, just so we can kind of control the ambient noise as much as we can. Um, tonight, we have two special uh, guests with us, and I will introduce them in a second, but uh, I did want to make note of a couple other forums as OPA continues to try to respond to our members' needs and also trying to provide as much support as we can. Uh, this is the evolution of some of those discussions. Um, next Wednesday, which is April 15th at 8 p.m., the Prevention and Wellness Program of OPA will be hosting a self-care and wellness forum, and that will be with Drs. Howard Fratkin and Carl Tischler. Uh, if you saw Howard's first uh, prevention and wellness program uh, session. It really was remarkable and certainly would want to invite all of you. Uh, the registration information for it will be available on the OPA website, uh, ohiopsych.com. And then again, that's Wednesday, next Wednesday the 15th at 8 p.m. And then the following Friday, we will have a insurance and billing question and answer. Uh, session. And so Dr. Jim Broyles, who is OPA's Director of Professional Affairs, has been gracious to uh, volunteer his time. And we also will have Dr. Matt Capizzuto joining us again. Uh, both Jim and Matt have done a number of these sessions. So tonight's session will not emphasize the billing and insurance aspects of telepractice, but more logistics and uh, process. So again, that will be the following Friday at 8 o'clock. So again, registration will open up for that tomorrow. And again, those are both linked on the OPA website. So I do wanna take a moment to introduce tonight's uh, presenters. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Kelly Martinson. Uh, she received her doctorate at Cleveland State University, uh, co completed her pre-doctoral internship at the Hampton uh, VA in Hampton, Virginia, and completed her fellowship in chronic pain management at the Cleveland clinic before becoming a staff psychologist at the Cleveland VA, uh, VA with behavior medicine. And she has worked in integrated medical settings. She routinely utilizes telehealth to allow veterans with disabilities and other disadvantages greater access to care. Uh, her primary areas of interest are chronic pain, neurocognitive disorders, and wellness within the geriatric population. She is also uh, very kind to serve as our chair of the Public Sector Interest Committee for OPA. And so Kelly, thank you so much for both uh, your service to OPA as well as your willingness to be a part tonight. And then our next uh, presenter is Dr. Cindy Van Curen. Uh, Cindy has received her doctorate in clinical psychology at Xavier in 2003, which we just learned a moment ago was their inaugural class Mm -hmm. She completed her pre-doctoral internship at the Cleveland VA in 2003 uh, before moving on to a two-year residency in pain, uh, chronic pain rehabilitation at the Cleveland Clinic. After spending 15 years at the Cleveland VA, she's now a staff psychologist with the Cleveland Clinic Neurological Institute. Her primary uh, practice in interests are chronic pain management, adapting and coping with disability, headache management, and program development. And equally so, Cindy is the president-elect of the Ohio Psychological Association. And Cindy and I, along with Mr. Rennie, our CEO, have spent an incredible amount of quality time over the last few uh, weeks as we continue to try to serve our members. So please welcome both Kelly and Cindy. And I certainly turn the virtual floor with our social distancing over to both of you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so, so we have at the OPA staff and leadership are just trying so hard to come up with novel ways to meet the evolving needs of our members. And in response to all of the things that keep coming up on the listserv, that's when we get together and we create these forums. So the wellness forum that Eric mentioned, the insurance forums and so forth. And we know people have a lot of just practical questions about 
you know, being, being online with a patient for the first time and, and establishing rapport and so forth. So we thought we would just try this tonight and see if this works. And if so, we'll offer more. Uh, we hope to get a group of facilitators that can rotate through, keep it nice and small so we can get to everybody's questions as well. So with that in mind, if you uh, want to type a question into the chat box, you uh, move your, your uh, mouse down towards the bottom of the screen, a ribbon will pop up and the chat box is in the center. You type in a chat question and Kelly will uh, move that into the discussion when appropriate. Otherwise, please just join in. That's why we kept it small. We have kind of an ambitious agenda of what we'd like to cover, but we really are just here to answer your questions. Uh, we really would hope to get to deciding if telehealth is appropriate for use with particular patients, uh, how to get consent, making sure you're doing the appropriate documentation, um, any sort of scheduling procedures related to safety and emergencies, competencies. I'm the, I was previously the chair for the Communications and Technology Committee, which developed the competencies. We're happy to speak to that. Best practices, common problems. Uh, the reason we're not including insurance is because Kelly and I did all of our telemedicine experience at the VA. So we just simply don't have that knowledge. I'm at the clinic now, but I'm on inpatient, so I'm still not doing telemedicine. So but anything else, I'll go ahead and, and just kind of turn the, the floor over to you. But again, you know, we hope we are doing our best to move through all those topic areas. But, but what made you kind of sign up for this? What are folks interested in knowing about the practical day-to-day -day of telehealth? So really, I, I would encourage everybody that this really um, is designed to answer your very specific questions. So mm -hmm. please do either jump on in or type a question in the chat box so we can really begin to tailor this to you. If your questions are very broad, as in, I don't even know where to start, feel free to give us that feedback too, and we can start from the very beginning. How do you identify the right kinds of patients um, and, and start from most of you are muted, so if you have a question you want to ask, um, scroll down toward the bottom of the uh, box and um, click on the, on the mute, unmute button. Okay, great. We've got our first question. Elizabeth wants to know how to get the initial informed consent. Yeah, so again, within the VA, and I'm assuming most of you are non-VA, but I'll just kind of, again, go through both processes. Within the VA, there's a standard informed consent for receiving care as a veteran. So that's kind of covered. Um, and then in the actual session for telehealth, we introduce that we're doing telehealth and what the, the restrictions are. So that part would be broader. Uh, so I'll go through that more specifically in a second. From in the private sector, what a lot of folks seem to have started doing is doing some sort of email or uh, a, a PDF document to the patient ahead of time, just saying, again, here are the limitations of doing a telehealth visit. Um, you know, these are the expectations in terms of safety, being honest about where you are and so forth. And all of that would go out ahead of time, be returned so questions could be addressed and right at the beginning of the session rather than go through a whole session that's uncomfortable for the person yeah. and, and decide together. In uh, both settings, I would encourage you to document in every single telehealth note that it is a telehealth visit and that you obtained consent for that forum in that visit. Um, and for those of you who haven't necessarily gone through all the trainings and competencies beforehand to do telemedicine and are kind of just in crisis mode with so many people, I would even just add a statement to that effect that you're getting consultation, you're following the guidelines to the best of your ability and you'll, you know, get to the trainings when it makes sense to do so. Um, Cindy, um, so in my situation and that of other people, we left our offices, we brought home whatever we could. Many of us, maybe we have a patient's email address and maybe we don't, but most of us didn't use email with patients, so we don't have consent to even email them, which if you email them, that is 
clearly putting personal health information out on the internet. Um, when I call them from an unrecognized phone number, they don't answer because it's not recognized. <laughs> and when I, um, so there's, okay, so there's the call, there's the, the can email. Um, mm -hmm. On another chat, which uh, I said, well, maybe we should just send, I should just send them a letter. Oh, and their voicemails are usually full. You know, people just don't clear out their voicemail on their phone. And the psychologist who was an um, APA person said, oh, no, don't send them a letter because, uh, first of all, they're not going to like getting a letter. They might not even open it. But also, that could violate their, you know, that's mm -hmm. sending. So I'm like, oh, my goodness, how do I begin this? So... Um, with two, I did successfully reach them by phone. They answered. And then they gave me two. a verbal. Two of my patients out of several. Um, they gave me a, a verbal, yes, I'd love to. I'd love to do telehealth. I'd love to do the video part. Um, but they, I think the ver verbally getting, well, first of all, was verbal consent okay? And then... When people give you an email address verbally, it often is not, especially if it's like a funny, weird one, not a professional one. Um, so email, emailing them the link did not work. We ended up on the call. And I know calls are now allowed, but it's not the best practice. So I guess it's the verbal consent. Is that a good start? Um, then the other thing is with these links, like through Doxy, does the link expire? It doesn't seem to have a time. It's my, these platforms are not integrated with my EHR and I'm not inclined to really want to change my EHR. So um, I think we've hit all the, all the elements there. Yes, those are great ones. And actually, because I, I imagine that the the questions that you've brought up, I imagine those affect some of the other folks on the call as well. Is this sounding familiar? I've got some frozen, there we go. I've got some frozen frozen folks there. Okay, okay. so in terms of verbal consent, I mean, I, I assume to some extent that parallels what we would do to, to get a relationship started with a person anyway. There's got to be some sort of expression of interest and in, in then how we're communicating to them. I don't know why mailing them a letter would be any more of a violation than a healthcare provider sending a letter for a, an appointment. Yeah, you've yeah. Yeah. heard of that as a violation. Um, so. yeah, I, I mean, if you have any questions about that, Elizabeth, you, you can always consult the ethics committee, um, mm -hmm. but I, we mail letters all the time. Yeah, um, I, you know, I thought that was a little, a little odd, yeah. but, mm -hmm. you know, under the pressure of a, um, you know, extemporaneous webinar, people may say things that they didn't intend it to come out that way. So. Yeah. If you're concerned, you can always consult the ethics committee, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, yeah, that lady's crazy. Um, the other thing, the other concern that you brought up is people not answering phone numbers that they don't know. And another concern that's been raised <laughs> is a lot of people are now not having access to their office phones. And you don't want to use maybe your personal cell phone to be mm -hmm. con contacting patients. Um, there is an app for your cell phone called Doximity Dialer um, that I've been using for my home practice. Um, and what it does is it's only open to healthcare providers. And what we can then do is basically copy our office numbers. So my phone calls look like they're coming from the Parma VA. Um, and so they come from my office phone number, not my personal cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you have to submit your NPI when, mm -hmm. um, when you use it. So that way it looks like the patient is receiving a call from my office. It doesn't look like it's coming from my cell phone. Um, because I don't know about you guys, but a lot of my patients have the office phone number saved as the mm -hmm. part in their phone so they know to pick up. Um, mm -hmm. So if, um, if that's something that you're interested in doing, again, it's called Doximity. Um, mm -hmm. it's an app for your phone, you do have to submit your NPI. Um, and so you can 
first of all, afford yourself a level of privacy and also give reassurance to your patient that it's the right person calling them um, so they're more likely to pick up. So there's a workaround for you there. Yeah, that's great. Is there a cost? Mm -hmm. And if that? you're in a position Great. where you have a website for your practice, uh, you know, even if you could put a link to the informed consent document, and OPA has on their website an informed consent document that you mm -hmm. can use uh, as your, your basis yeah. as well. Well, I don't want to monopolize the time, but my second question has to do with getting a website set up. And uh, I never needed one. And uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of research. A lot of research and it could be a lot of money and uh, a few dead ends so far lots of sales pitches so maybe we can cover that but I, I don't want to um, you know bulldoze the time into just my yeah, question that might be a little beyond the purview of today's conversation but um, wow yeah that's that, but that's I, I have a thought that I'll if I have any success I'll post it on the listserv or send it out to you because I've noticed a lot of people who can't do their business right now are just volunteering services. Uh, and I have a friend that works at volunteer, volunteer Business Bureau, whatever it's called, Unlimited. And so those folks, that's their whole job is just sort of giving their services to promote businesses. I just wonder if there's anybody out there looking to help with things like this. And if I come across some resources, I'll share those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Okay, so the next thing is um, Eric wanted to send a reminder about the next OPA sessions. Um, there's a prevention and wellness program next Wednesday, the 15th at eight o'clock. And there's also an insurance and billing form coming up on Friday, the 17th at eight o'clock. Um, so everybody mark your calendars and be watching the listserv for those announcements. Um, those sound just absolutely brilliant. Um, so the next one is from Deb Johnny. She says, most of my clients right now are those whom I've been seeing in the office. I'm using telehealth during the crisis time. Um, what are best practices uh, can you share in connecting with new clients? Yeah, absolutely. So a, a couple things is I just sort of set the tone in terms of just trying to make them comfortable and um, find out how comfortable they are with technology and how comfortable they are kind of doing this back and forth. I always uh, assure the patient that I'm in a private room uh, that their privacy is being re respected on my end. And I try to find out if anybody else is in the room or house or immediate environment on their end as well. So I can be respectful of their privacy. Um, there's just little tricks that can be helpful. I never wear white when I'm on telemedicine because I am very pale and it just really looks kind of uncomfortable to people when they're watching me. Um, when you're talking with the patient, you're actually trying to make sure that you look directly into the camera instead of at the patient, which is again, awkward. And when I'm doing chronic pain assessments and I need to see their braces and see their pain and so forth, it takes a little adjusting. But when you look directly at the camera, it will look to the patient as though you're making eye contact with them. If you do need to do something else and, and again, assess, you know, can you show me where your pain is? Um, I just tell them I'm, I'm going to be looking at you and it's going to just look awkward on your end for, for the time that we're talking about this. And that seems to help set the tone as well. Being conscientious of your environment so that you don't have a lot of personal things behind you that will distract or um, a bunch of five hour energies or your bottle of whiskey, whatever it is, just make sure it's not there. And because we're all, you know, we all don't see our own clutter. I would even do a practice call really quickly with a friend and just say, what do you see around me? Is this okay to do? So little things that just set them at ease. Uh, there's things that you're going to miss. You're not gonna be able to tell if they're malodorous. You might not have a good camera angle to notice if they, um, are not groomed very well. Uh, and the, the only thing I, I would really encourage you to adjust for as well is the silent tears. Because if you're just kind of having the back and forth conversation, you're not gonna see them. So I always just kind of build in a pause when a patient's speaking before I respond. So I can catch a hiccup or catch any sort of little delay there that might give me some more information about those details. Mm -hmm. Kelly, did you wanna add anything to that? Um, no, I, I think you covered um, the bulk of it. I think the only thing that I've been noticing more now that I'm doing 
not just a handful of telehealth sessions like I was a couple weeks ago, but the bulk of my practice now as telehealth. The thing that I've been finding is that, frankly, um, maybe almost we take this so much more seriously than some of our patients might be right now. Um, yeah. So setting the tone that this is a doctor's appointment, um, that it will be conducted the same way as if we were in the office, um, because I've had some very strange sessions lately. Um, this morning, I had someone <laughs> eating their breakfast at 8.30 this morning. Um, and it, you know, obviously it was, it was very difficult because that was an intake. Um, that was a brand new patient. And, um, you know, so trying to really understand what was going on and, you know, saying to him, <laughs> you know, sir, is this a bad time? <laughs> you know, because I'm asking him, and he's literally eating his Cheerios. And I'm like, okay, um, you know, so trying to, to set, um, to set that expectation early on that this is still the standard appointment that we'd be having um, if you were in the office. Um, and so I've been trying to do a lot more on the initial phone call when I'm setting the time. Um, you know, and the way I do that is I couch that in a statement about privacy rules and regulations, that the privacy rules and regulations are the same for telephone and video appointments as they would be for um, in-person assessments. Do you have any questions about that? Our session will be the same. Um, you'll still get the same quality of care. And that, um, that seems to set similar expectations um, and things go a little bit better, um, Cheerio session notwithstanding. Um, so. yeah. My favorite was the guy who worked for like a bomb squadron and he called me, he's all in his gear, in a metal golf cart while he was out in the field. He just took time away to call me for our session. So yeah, I agree with Kelly. Patients are much more flippant about this than I would like for them to be. So again, setting that tone and, and certainly if it's appropriate, even adding that to your informed consent document. Well, and, and, you know, one of the tips that we have for you guys is always at the beginning of your session, find out exactly where the patient is, um, you know, because anything could happen. They could have a seizure or something that you might need to get emergency services to them. So if they're not at their house, where are they? If they're at their friend's house or something like that, get the address at the beginning of your session because literally anything could go wrong. So if they're driving in their car, where are they driving to? Um, something like that. So if they're on a golf cart in the middle of a field, at least try to get the approximate location just in case, you know, because literally anything could happen. Um, and again, the patient's not going to take this nearly as seriously as you are. We're thinking worst case scenario all the time. They are not thinking worst case scenario, it, but it's our job to plan for the worst case. It's not their job to do that. So, okay. In um, keeping with that, if I can just add to in terms of safety and, and being as, as proactive about that as you can, you know, if you practice within a certain geographic region, having non-emergency contact numbers for the local cities, uh, if you want to well check on a patient or, or something like that, having all of that just kind of in a document ahead of time, because because we all know obviously how hard it is to pink slip and to do all of those things under emergency circumstances and now do not have the patient physically present. Um, just make sure you know what resources are available to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are just some of the, the great safety guidelines. Okay, um, that was a great question. All right, yeah. um, the next one is from Marisa. Um, a big question I have is about engaging uh, children in the session, definitely, that's a good one. What suggestions do you have for some games activities we can use? How do you go about keeping kids engaged when they have communication difficulties or anxiety that impacts communication even during in-person sessions? That is a wonderful question. Uh, so I am gonna, I was just thinking, gosh, I don't know how to engage kids in real life. So I, I, I'm gonna need a little help with that one. Uh, but Kelly and I, before this started, actually had decided we, we definitely want to include a child psychologist as a consultant on this to speak to those very things. Uh, just as a non-child psychologist and a person who does not have children, 
one idea that comes to mind are some of the things they do with biofeedback. And, and I'm certainly not encouraging you to practice beyond your scope or beyond your comfort. But in terms of just some of the breathing exercises, breathing uh, in, with a crescendo to music and a decrescendo, I wonder if some things like that that might be available uh, that could be engaging and have a lot of great science behind them. Um, it's, it's just a thought that comes to mind, but I, I welcome other ideas about that. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any great tips for children either um, because my practice has frankly mostly been with older adults. Um, right. Right. So, um, you know, specializing in geriatrics, I am well at the other end of the life spectrum. Um, but I would think that that really so much of what we already do in in the room really can be brought online. Um, so if, if you're already doing something physically there, um, don't hesitate to just give it a try. And if it doesn't work, okay. Um, you know, just be creative and um, be bold. And if it doesn't work out, you know, that's okay. Um, you'll have a great learning experience and you'll know how to tailor it for next time. And professionally, I'm a school psychologist, so we've had to do a lot of uh, almost baptism by fire here trying to do tele-school psychology, which is, would almost be its probably own separate discussion of how to navigate assessment issues and, and child and adolescent issues. Um, for the most part though, at this point, um, we are trying to delimit what we're doing therapeutically um, to more acute crisis situations. If children have the cognitive or developmental capacity to engage online, uh, then we may do some of the uh, brief work. Um, but again, it's I, I think Kelly, as you said just a bit ago, still trying to structure this with the formality that it is sort of a doctor's appointment. Um, is kind of hard because our children are so used to computer mediated communication. And then suddenly this becomes very informal and it becomes um, full of <laughs> um, some, uh, some uncomfortableness and maybe some latitudes that we wouldn't normally see. So um, we may want to think Cindy and Kelly, if we want to do one of these more targeted to child and adolescent issues and the assessment issues. And, you know, I, I certainly- I, I think that'd be fantastic. That. Yeah, we can certainly put that on the docket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then Eric asked, um, giving a link to the app. The app should be downloaded to your phone, so I don't have it on my computer to share the screen, but I typed out the name for it, and I don't know how well people can see my phone, but I brought it up on the app store. Um, can anyone even see that at all? Not really. It's a blue P is the icon, but I spelled it out for you. Um, it's called Doximity. Um, have your NPI ready to download it. It does require your NPI to download. Um, it's free so what to download. some of the other challenges or, or questions that folks have run into with this really fast turnaround and transition to a technology-based practice? Well, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts, as you'd mentioned at the beginning about um, who's appropriate and who's inappropriate. We've had some new intakes come in in, in our practice that I'm in. And um, we certainly can identify, you know, the extreme examples of individuals of who are inappropriate, like somebody who had a suicide attempt this past weekend, um, had an intake on Monday. Right, exactly. I see your face. That's exactly what I thought too. <laughs> um, so we are getting her engaged in a higher level of care and, and she's all taken care of. So to me, that's very obvious. Um, where I kind of struggle are those in between people when I get somebody who I'm like, I really feel like you need DBT. I don't offer DBT. I really want to get you connected. Um, but in the context of the current situation that we're in, where everybody is doing teletherapy and people are having a hard time connecting and getting those referrals to connect, I don't want to leave somebody kind of left to their own devices at the same time. So I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm walking this kind of treacherous line of like, I really don't feel like you're appropriate on my caseload. But at the same time, I'm really working hard to try to get you connect, connected to the right place. But this environment is not exactly conducive. Right. And I, I would say those are kind of two different areas, too, because 
we all run into that in general in person practice that this isn't my area and I'd like to sort of send you on, but that sending on process is not quite so smooth these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting back to your first one about some considerations, um, the things that, the problems that I've run into are people that are just really, really hard of hearing. Even if you were yelling into your microphone, which is then of course violating their privacy, if they just really can't hear you, it's just not gonna be successful. If they are so uncomfortable with technology that they're distracted the whole time, that is also going to probably not go well, or you're gonna spend the entire visit just troubleshooting with them uh, and trying to help them to kind of figure out where all the buttons are and how to make things happen. If they have a system where there's picture in picture, patients just get so distracted looking at themselves that I would you know, make sure you can guide them through the process of turning that off. Uh, but one other area I always try to screen for, and so historically I've never done my own scheduling for telemedicine. I had clinics, they just loaded them up as they would in person. But I would always make a point of reviewing the charts the day before because if they scheduled someone with acute psychosis, I didn't want to have the, you know, introduce myself to them on the TV. And even thinking about our general st mental status questions, do you think the TV is talking to you? Well, the TV is talking to them. I mean, we're really kind of creating this mixed reality that is, is uh, I think, stressful for folks. In those cases where they're already on my schedule, I would just call them and explain everything to them, do a, a brief, at least five minute screen on the phone and offer to see them in person back when that was an option, offer to see them in person at the same scheduled time. At this point, if there's acute psychosis and I'm concerned, I, I would you know, move to that second part of, of what you're bringing up, Sonia, and just say, you know, can we, we've got to come up with some other arrangement that's going to make sense for you. Um, and then Kelly, I don't know if you want to chime in on either of Sonia's questions. No, no, I, I echo everything you said. Um, the biggest one for me is definitely the sensory deficits. Um, that we, we have to screen for those things. If someone has, um, you know, hearing impairment, visual impairments, this might not be the best fit for them. And, um, you know, obviously the psychosis questions, those are the, those are the two that I are, are hot buttons for me as well. Um, so definitely. And then also therapeutic moda modalities sometimes um, that there are just certain things that obviously we, we need to do in person. So. Okay, um, the next question comes from Christy. Christy's doing pre-transplant evaluations. Can we talk a bit more specifically about conducting these complex interviews and patient appropriateness? Definitely, Cindy, I know that's something both you and I, we know a little bit about. Take it away. Yes, yes, and so Christy might remember, I was the spinal cord stimulator evaluation queen. Uh, so I ha actually have done a lot of pre-transplant evaluations by telemedicine, even again, when the world was a little more um, typical because the facility was the only one. And so I could assess for people throughout the state of Ohio to come up and actually have the procedure done in Cleveland. Um, in terms of the process, looking back, I don't know what I would say that I deliberately did different, but I can tell you things that didn't turn out so well. So it's, I think that's, in particular, I really want to have a good camera angle for that patient. I really need to see their pain behaviors. I really need to see how they're carrying their bodies. I need to see that they have a, a, a Chihuahua service dog at their feet. I, I really want that information. And I can think of one particular one where the camera was so far back, I really couldn't get any visual you know, affect information to see how congruent it was or anything else. So I would really make sure that you spend time with the patient or if you've got another person in the room helping that that camera angle's got to be spot on. Um, and I also think it's important, I think the consent process for pre-transplant evals is more complicated anyway, because you are that information isn't necessarily private. It isn't between the two of you. That's the patient's not your audience. Um, so I think that, again, trying to make sure that they understand that the person the, the, the bodiless head that's interviewing them has a really significant role in the outcome of this process and what they share isn't, isn't between the two of you on the screen, it's gonna be related in another way. 
Uh, I also always make sure that patients understand it is not being recorded in any way, whether that is a transplant eval or anything else. Uh, it's just a, a really important step, I think, in terms of um, you know, making them feel secure. And, and Kelly, if I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, um, no, Cindy, you covered what I would be concerned about. Christy, the only things that I would add for you, depending on what type of evaluations you're doing and what your typical method is, um, a lot of the different assessment tools are being brought online. Um, I know, um, I wanna say MMPI and MCMI, um, there's, there's different statements about how those can be done um, remotely. I've been at least doing my MOCAs um, remotely if you need to do that. Um, so there's, there's a different statement from different testing um, groups about how to be doing those online right now. Um, and the other thing that I would encourage you to do when I've been doing any kind of assessment um, virtually is the one thing that I always remind myself um, anytime I get in that situation, and I might even prep the patient for this, that you are not locked into only one session. If you feel like you need more time, if you need to have that patient back, you, you can have them back. You can take more time, especially right now. You do not need to render that opinion immediately. Um, any kind of pre-transplant evaluations are just too important. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that would be my biggest piece of advice for you to really take your time, make sure you're comfortable. If you need to have that patient back, do it. Um, have a second session with the patient, take the extra time. Um, you know, their life is too important. And, and as for testing, I noticed Carl Stukenberg posted an update today on the OPA listserv about that. So it sounds like his, one of his organizations is uh, actively trying to evaluate effective use of, of different measures online. So it sounds like he's, he's just volunteered to keep OPA members updated on that. Okay. All right, um, and let's see. Next question is from Deb Johnny. Um, would you use different slash additional screening questions for teletherapy patients? Hmm, I, I'm not sure if I would use different screening questions. I mean, I do adjust my mental status exam again because I kept catching myself asking if the if they ever think the TV is talking to them. <laughs> so I mean, I make those kind of subtle adjustments. Um, different or additional screening questions. I, I'm not sure anything comes to mind. How about you, Kelly? Um, not off the top of my head. I, I guess it would depend on what the referral question is. Um, mm -hmm. if the referral question might, um, might deem that, but by and large, especially for my intakes, um, my, my intake in person is almost identical to my teletherapy. Really, the informed mm -hmm. consent is where the two are very different. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, next question from Marisa. Um, what if you are meeting with a client and they're in their room and you're seeing, hearing something that they not, did not mean for you to see or hear? Um, what suggestions do you have for approaching the situation? For example, you are seeing drug and alcohol paraphernalia. Yes, I, I was hoping someone would bring this up because that's again, you know, if I'm if I'm missing things in my own environment that aren't offensive or or illicit or illegal, you can imagine our patients are desensitized to their own environments, and we may see those things. Um, other things that I worry about are signs that we see child abuse or or other things that we might need to report or at least at very least need to discuss. Um, I'm in terms of seeing drug paraphernalia before I'm just. I'm just a transparent person and I would say, hey, can you tell me about the bong sitting on the counter behind you? I mean, I would just go ahead and invite that discussion because they know that you saw it anyway. At some point, they're going to realize it. Um, and, it and just addressing that as part of the therapy tool in building a sense of safety um, that, you know, it's just important we're being honest about these things and so forth. Drug and alcohol paraphernalia, as far as I know, that's not something we would need to report versus abuse, but it obviously factors into your um, conceptualization of a patient and the strength of your rapport and how honest they're being with you and whether there's just that one more problem that perhaps needs to be addressed. Um, but that would be my recommendation is just to say, I, I noticed this and I, I just wanna make sure that we can talk about it. What do you think, Marissa, would that work? 
maybe keep it. Oh, there we go. Okay, and abuse and neglect, absolutely. I do, I do have some thoughts about this, but I, I, Kelly, I don't know if you wanna go ahead and take a stab at that one first. Um, I think with the drug and alcohol thing, I think the most important thing is that we have to be very comfortable talking about it. Be like, mm -hmm. okay, Lee, yeah, let's talk about your bong in the background there. Um, because if we're uncomfortable, they're gonna sense it and they're going to be uncomfortable. Um, transitioning into abuse and neglect. I mean, again, that's where the informed consent, they should have already known that we're mandated reporters. That, sh that shouldn't be news. Um, but that obviously is a much more, much more delicate issue. Um, thank goodness that's actually not one that I've run into um, yet. Thank goodness. Um, I, I have run into um, adult abuse and neglect. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's a very different issue, I think, than child and abuse and neglect, which I think is a dicier subject. Um, mm -hmm. So, Cindy, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm actually going to put Eric on deck for that in just a minute. Um, but in terms of the domestic violence piece and the, the child abuse, I've noticed that there's been some, some conversation on the listserv about that as well. So we can certainly further look into... Uh, you know, credible resources and, and what folks have been able to do. Because that's a, a fear that I have is, you know, if a kid's not going to school anymore where someone might notice these bruises and then we're the only person there. And how are you talking to the, the, the kid about what's going on when we don't, we don't know that mom's not standing right next door or, or right, you know, outside the door. So, so I definitely want to um, come up with a, 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 a comprehensive response for that, which I'm, I'm not sure I entirely have right now, but I think that's an important thing for us to look at. And Eric, obviously this is something I imagine you guys are preparing for. Um, do you have any thoughts if you notice abuse or neglect um, doing telemedicine? Actually, I just finalized our district procedures for our the large urban district I work for. And uh, the guidance is very straightforward that you continue to be a mandated reporter. You continue to have those duties that have to be discharged. And the, uh, the legal standard is that a reasonable person has a suspicion of abuse or neglect, not even credible evidence that would trigger your mandated reporter obligation. So in this case, if, if there is a reasonable belief that a child is being abused or neglected, then that would trigger your mandated reporter obligations to both protect child welfare by contacting your local children's services, uh, but also then to discharge your obligation and appreciating that it's a two-part requirement as we all know. So um, to follow up on that, we are perhaps um, tempted or could be tempted to um, do our own sort of quasi-investigation, which is not what I think we should be doing, but rather documenting our observations in a dispassionate but meaningful way. And they could be things like um, um, child says there's no food in the house. Um, I had two saltines for breakfast and um, my, my, my mom had the other two. Uh, and maybe you do ask the mom, is, is there a food situation in your house? It's not for us to say there's no food, but rather what was reported to us. Um, I just don't know what is going to get, I mean, we're not, I haven't had to report anybody for anything in decades, but there was always that push by the child protective or adult protective um, agencies to get me to almost do the investigation as if I was the fact finder and the conclusion drawer. And so I think I would be as, I just be very careful because their resources are even thinner now, even thinner than they've ever been. And they're so overstretched, especially in the, the drug infested uh, counties. But we've got to be very, um, you know, and I think there's a difference between a parent who is like, I really do need food, but I don't know where to get it. Right. Um, and a parent who is too high to provide food. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, no, we're, but, we're teetering in that. So, and I would scaffold that by saying, I'm also no DJFS child maltreatment trainer. 
And remember, our duty as mandated reporters, whether we're looking at this as psychologists or physicians or educators or anyone who falls under that umbrella, is not to substantiate or investigate abuse. That being said, uh, all of our ADA counties use a network of computers called SACWIS, which is a database, and they need information to be able to decide how to triage a case. And that does put us in conflict sometimes with both trying to get information while at the same time um, not embarking on our own independent investigation. And so um, at the end of the day, though, our duty is ultimately just to report our suspicions or concerns, um, not to actually engage in anything further. And it is always fine to simply call and report our concerns based on the information or observations or our suspicions at that particular moment. Um, beyond that, then, um, you know, there may be a therapeutic benefit or other needs to query that. If it's an issue of food insecurity or, or things of that sort, you know, there also may be some opportunities there to do some quasi uh, social uh, work, social linkage to um, maybe community resources that that person might have, which may help with an immediacy issue. And to that effect, uh, our OPA's Committee on Social Responsibility has compiled a fantastic and comprehensive list of resources for folks struggling with food insecurities and, and other needs during this difficult time with, you know, abrupt unemployment and so forth. So, so if that is a concern, you know, there may be a very gentle way to say, uh, you know, just lots of people in your area are struggling. Here's a, a food bank that goes on every Saturday or something. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. That's, I mean, that's a broader issue, APS and, and uh, Child Protective Services and yeah. how open they are to our ideas. All right, we have 10 minutes left. So Elizabeth is asking about uh, self-recording of data and rating scales. So just a couple thoughts that come to mind. Number one, I assume this is limited to big hospitals, but I will still bring it up. Uh, that within EHRs, there are sometimes the, the secure communication direct with patients. Um, so that would certainly be one way. That's a way that I've often sent out uh, handouts or protocols or whatever I might need for the patient. Um, but if it's a self-rating a self scale, if it's something that's not overly complicated, if it's a SUD scale or something like that, I would just have them kind of tell you about it and make that the therapeutic intervention tool as well. I would also say there's lots of different ways to get creative too. I mean, if you're doing a video chat, they can hold it up and say, hey, look, look at, here's my homework. Um, I've had some people do that with um, like some of their sleep logs and things like that so that I can actually be looking at them and scribbling my notes real quickly. Um, and depending on what they're working on too, if, um, you know, sometimes there's also a certain amount of pride in what they're working on that they want to show. Me. So if they're, you are using a video format, don't, don't hesitate to actually let them hold it up and show you, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they, they might get something out of that interaction. Um, you know, it, it, it could be something that they're, they're making a point of pride. So, um, somebody it, said um, about using share my screen. I'm not sure what that Oh. is in this uh i mean i've done share my screen with like tech support um nice. but i don't know how one would do that with a hipaa compliant uh platform and i never even thought to look for that as a feature uh an interesting <laughs> idea and i can tell you i never thought of it either and i'm always drawing little pictures of neurotransmitters <laughs> and making people look at them they would probably really prefer mm -hmm. i use a screen share if that's a, so if that's HIPAA compliant so Johnny, came, go ahead. Yeah, I came across that only because uh, our family has, a, we, it's a pretty large group of people and not everybody equally participatory. So one day we just started playing hangman and that became a really neat way. You know, all of us have a sketch pad on our computer. So oh, if you can just, I don't, up a, yeah, if you can I just, don't know how you get that. <laughs> um, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can figure out a, a short, simple <laughs> one and maybe send one out. But uh, I heard you say you use Doxy Me. Um, I've tried to. Uh, so far, not successful. But that's everybody. Many people love it. And then there are two others I'm looking into. 
So the DocSeeMe professional version allows you to share files and to share your screen. So okay. sometimes I, I send my, my, my informed consent and forms through DocSeeMe and then they upload it back up because you can request a patient. So sometimes I get homework that way if they're tech savvy. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, there is a, just like in Zoom, you can share your screen that really is a button. If you bring your thing back down to the ribbon, let's say today, if you wanted to share something, you, could, you oh. would just do share your screen and okay. everybody else could see it. So mm -hmm. most of these platforms I think have it. And so that might be a neat way. I, I don't do work with children. So mm -hmm. I, I don't use us. We use that in our family uh, mm -hmm. chat, if you will. Mm -hmm. but uh but if you have so i i think drawing i do a lot of drawings too but i'm holding up my sheet of paper like this you know and <laughs> and, and doing it sometimes i've thought of getting a whiteboard but uh as i was saying this i'm like why haven't i used it so mm -hmm. i'm glad i shared it because next time i'm going to try it you've I'm been your own inspiration and i like it well, I'm a little worried because so what I have done, uh, somehow I'm just scared of many things and being on the ethics committee even more so. So I do all my client work from a computer that has nothing on it. Mm. Now, mm. Most of us don't have that luxury, right? I mean, we operate out of one computer. So now I've created a separate uh, zip drive with just my handout so that if I need to shoot something back and forth, I don't have to go toggle mm -hmm. back between two physical computers because I'm just scared. You know, uh, there's so much of technology I think we don't know. But anyway, I won't get into that. That's my little bandwagon. But, um, but, but, but it's, it's very an interesting easy. thought. If we, if we end up putting in a long-term infrastructure that ends up including technology, you yeah. know, does it make sense to have a sort of a separate separate system mm -hmm. without any access to personal information. Because I just don't know when we click on links, where else in my computer things are going. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I do my reports on my computer and even though they're uh, password protected, I don't want stuff flying. <laughs> I just have this vision mm -hmm. things are getting sucked out and I'm not in a psychotic way, please. But, <laughs> Um, Do you ever I, think the TV is talking to you, Deb Johnny? Not so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So really quick, I want to point out Marissa's tip, which I love, as she has a laminated copy of the PHQ dry erase marker, the patient's responses, show it to him to get confirmation, and then I assume documenting that in the note. I think that's a wonderful idea. All right, yeah. we, we only have four yeah. minutes left, but it's, I do want um, quick feedback. Some, is it worth... Uh, Inter offering additional forums like this on an ongoing basis where people can share ideas and, and adjust and consult with one another on this changing forum. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got Elizabeth. Yeah. Me too. I'm enjoying this because I learn from other people. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what about the idea of, again, if we just have a pool of six or eight consultants and kind of we rotate through so we aren't uh, you're not limited to our ideas and we don't get overwhelmed. I absolutely like the child specific one. Also thinking a BWC specific one. Uh, I, you know, I think there's some other folks that we could really do to target the needs of our, our members um, and try to get that in place. I mean, Kelly, because we, Kelly, you and I were going to debrief after this. What are your thoughts about um, other feedback you might want from the group? Other than a child specific one, we're thinking a BWC specific one. Do you guys have any other feedback about specific topics you might be wanting? Um, so I've only been doing this for two weeks. <laughs> I'm sure as I do more, I will realize that there are more areas. So right now I'm just trying to manage the current caseload that I've had. And I've only had two new clients and I've just, my outgoing message just says I'm not taking new people until uh, a few weeks from now, just mm -hmm. until I regroup, so to speak, um, and take all the training and finish it. I'm almost done with one of them. Okay. Um, but I'm sure that, that there will be more because I think that if we're expanding this as a competency, then there are going to be elements to it. And you guys obviously have far more experience. Uh, so it's helpful to hear that. Yeah. The, um, some folk a focus on um, the 
uh, like the mental status kind of assessment, I think would be really useful because that's applicable across all disciplines, although with kids and adolescents, it's a little different than adults, um, but how to make adjustments on, on some of that. And then I picked up in one of the webinars, I took something I really did want to share with everybody because it was the question of what if your client is doing something really inappropriate on camera? And one of the participants would say, um, some, it was something that was limit setting, but not, it didn't have teeth in it, so to speak. Sorry for the metaphor. But um, the, another person said, and I wrote this down because I think it's so valuable. She said, I will say, I have zero tolerance for that on this medium. I have zero tolerance for that. This is a professional setting. I am going to hang up now. If you would like to discuss why you feel you need to do it, we can set aside a time for that. End of story. And I thought that was so well put. Um, just really succinct and to the point. Um, and we've all had to do limit setting in sessions. Mm -hmm. And maybe we did that, but we wouldn't have taken out such a strong, such a big gun on the, on a video chat um, without having a, the the model before us, so I thought I would share that since it's it's got to be wonderful. in the back of everybody's mind. I have zero tolerance for that. I'm like, my gosh, you hit the nail on the head. You did a great. That was so useful. So I think that's great. I think that's great. All right, and with that, Eric reminds us that we are coming to a close. So, um, so Kelly and I are going to do a little strategizing, watch for some additional announcements of these coming up. Uh, remember to sign up if you're interested in the Prevention and Wellness Forum next Wednesday. Tomorrow's announcement will go out about the Insurance and Billing Forum next Friday. So watch for those. Okay. And again, if you've got, you know, I, I can certainly, I'm sure I can speak for Eric and Kelly and I, you can contact us directly. Um, because we want to get that information compiled and out to the broader audience and we're the world's getting overwhelmed by email. So if that's another avenue to contact us and then we'll kind of come up with an answer to share. And then just adding to that, Cindy, uh, OPA is here to work on behalf of all of you. And if there's a need as our members and our constituents that we need to help uh, fulfill or there is a gap in knowledge or just something that we can be doing uh, we are trying to be nimble and re, uh, responsive enough and just know that all of us will take immediate action and, and consideration on what you offer. And we will certainly try to, to attend to what you're asking for because we want to maximize your value of your membership. And we celebrate each of you for being a part of OPA. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate your Thank contribution. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.